Now, listen, if you're subscribed to me, I know you're probably here because of my Splatoon content, and I promise more of that is coming soon. But my latest hyperfixation has been on this new indie game, Freedom Planet 2, which was finally released after a seven year wait since it was announced back in 2015. And I really want to talk about it because it's genuinely one of the best 2D platformers I've ever played, and I don't think it's getting nearly the amount of attention it deserves. But in order to provide context for that review, I knew I would have to talk about the original Freedom Planet first, so here we are. For those of you who don't know, Freedom Planet originally started its life as a Sonic the Hedgehog fan game, but quickly grew into its own thing. After successfully being backed on Kickstarter, the game was created by indie studio Galaxy Trail, led by Sabrina Diduro, and released on Steam back in 2014, eventually being ported to the Wii U, PlayStation 4, and finally, the Nintendo Switch. The Wii U is where I first learned about it, as it was one of Nintendo's big nindies if you remember that marketing era. So naturally, I snatched it up and played a ton of it while I was in middle school. True to its roots, the game is a 16 to 32 bit style 2D platformer that borrows a lot of elements from the Sonic series, but also from various others. The best way I can explain its gameplay is if you took Mega Man X, specifically the way Zero plays in the PS1 games, and fused it with classic Sonic. While most of the platforming is heavily based around momentum, the combat usually isn't as simple as jumping on enemies to defeat them. Each character has a variety of attacks, mostly close range, that they can use to wail on enemies in unique ways. These attacks can sometimes even be chained together in unique ways to assist with platforming. Speaking of characters, there are three you can play as, and each of them has different aspects that make them entirely unique from the others. Lilac the Water Dragon is sort of the default main character of the game and her various attacks revolve around her whipping her enemies with her rope-like hair. She's the fastest character by default, which is further aided by her Dragon Boost, which grants her brief invulnerability as she blasts in direction at top speed. Carol the Wildcat is, in a lot of ways, the opposite of Lilac. Whereas much of Lilac's speed comes from her ability to Dragon Boost on command, provided her crystal meter is full, Carol relies much more on momentum. She can roll into a ball when going down slopes to pick up speed, and can unleash a flurry of short-range claw attacks and kicks to rain fire down on her foes. However, if she isn't quite fast enough for you, you can grab a fuel tank, which are hidden around the stages, and jump onto Carol's motorcycle. She keeps her general moveset like this, but is much faster, trades her pounds for a double jump, and can get a burst of speed on command. She's also the only character that can climb walls, and utilize these red jump panels, which, with proper timing, allow her to leap around the stage on a predetermined path. Finally, we have Mila, who's by far the most unique playable character. While being the slowest, Mila has a Yoshi-style flutter jump, allowing her to reach higher heights than Lilac and Carol can without using a wall. Additionally, rather than having her default attack be a scratch or whip like the other two, Mila pulls out a shield, which can reflect almost any projectile in the game back at her attacker, or explode in a small burst that does a little bit of damage. Additionally, she can pick up various objects in the stages, and if she uses this command while she's not near anything she can pick up, she'll summon a green cube that she can throw at her enemies, or use to significantly enhance her shield burst. This enhanced shield burst ends up becoming Mila's main means of attack due to the sheer amount of strength and range it has. Due to the way she can cheese a lot of the boss fights with her shield, Mila ended up being my favorite to play as. All three characters play extremely differently from one another, offering a different playstyle and different routes through each level based on either their abilities or minor story differences. Freedom Planet has 14 stages in total, excluding a shoot 'em up mini stage in the training rooms, with each character playing through 12 of them, meaning a couple stages are exclusive to certain characters. You can choose to play the game in classic mode, which plays like a typical 16-bit platformer, progressing from stage to stage with minimal story interactions, but at least for your first playthrough, I'd recommend going with adventure mode, which features fully voiced cutscenes between the stages and a really intriguing story revolving around Avalos' three kingdoms warring over the Kingdom Stone their main source of energy, while an alien warlord, Lord Revan, lurks in the shadows, attempting to steal it so he can power his ship and escape the planet. Overall, I'd say the story is one of the more mixed aspects of Freedom Planet. While the overall story is interesting and kept me invested in the game, it has some serious issues with tonal consistency. It seems like they couldn't decide whether they wanted the game to be a Saturday morning cartoon or an edgy early 2000s anime. For example, the game opens with a son witnessing the brutal murder of his father, and then a couple stages later, we just change to tween girls having a sleepover and casually hanging out. We go from the protagonist freaking out about how much they love sushi in one scene, to being brutally tortured on screen a few scenes later. Sonic Forces wishes it could be this edgy. They've been torturing him for months. There's just a lot of tonal whiplash that persists throughout the story, though it does get a lot more consistent later into the game. Not to mention, the ratio of cutscenes to gameplay is extremely skewed toward the cutscenes. 
there are stretches of 20 to 30 minutes of cutscenes between some stages, and while a couple stages can end up lasting that long, especially on a first playthrough of the game, most are over in around 10 minutes. So the sheer amount of cutscenes can definitely get tiring at some points, especially when you just want to get back to the gameplay. However, that's not to say the adventure mode is entirely bad. There's a lot of really great scenes within it, and the characters are all extremely well written. The protagonist's banter is charming and fun to watch, the story takes a lot of unexpected turns, and there's some really great humorous scenes and also some really emotionally packed ones. I'd say it's really similar to the stories of the Sonic Adventure games, where it takes itself so seriously that you just can't help but enjoy it. The voice acting is also pretty good for most of the cast, though there are a few characters whose mic quality is a little bit lower than the others, the audio balancing could use some work, and a few odd takes for dialogue were selected. There's some big names in here too. Don M. Bennett, who would go on to voice Shez in Fire Emblem Warriors Three Hopes, voices Lilac, and Sean Chiplock plays a personal favorite character of mine, Spade. Prince Dale of S Prince... <sighs> this is hard to be cool and suave while being informative at the same time. God damn my coolness. I liked more of the story than I disliked, it's just that playing the game as many times as I have, its flaws become a lot more apparent, especially when the vast majority of the cutscenes are shared between all three characters. And since I played through all three characters' adventure modes while gathering footage for this video, it started to get boring after a while. But the fact that the developers actually programmed cutscenes for some of the bloopers as an easter egg definitely helped to make things a bit more entertaining on repeat playthroughs. Well anyway, I got a big call from that big panda guy I told you. What? <laughs> big call! Because the panda is big! <laughs> Circling back around to gameplay though, it's extremely solid. And as I said earlier, each character offers a unique take on the game. But nearly every stage stands out in its own way as well, with unique aesthetics, enemies, and stage gimmicks. There's these speed boosters in Final Dreadnought 3, the bouncing bubbles in Jade Creek, the fans in Sky Battalion. Every stage feels completely different from the last, and have different ways of traversing them as a result. Some are more focused on outright speed, like Fortune Knight, while others put more emphasis on exploration, like Thermal Base. And some, like Battle Glacier, just overwhelm you with hordes of enemies that you're forced to fight or risk getting overwhelmed completely. And it never feels like they repeat, aesthetically or mechanically. Even the final four stages, which all take place aboard Brevin's ship, find ways to stand out despite being in the same setting. In terms of general gameplay, most levels are split into two halves, with each having unique gimmicks, aesthetics, and music. Some of the differences are drastic, like those of Relic Maze and Thermal Base, but others don't really change much, or at all. Each half is capped off by a boss, with the mid-boss usually being a lot easier than the main boss. Overall, this is a lot like the split between Act 1 and Act 2 in a Sonic game, just rolled into a single stage instead of two. As I mentioned earlier, each stage tends to go for around 10 to 15 minutes in total on a first playthrough, though about 7 to 10 on later playthroughs. The game offers four difficulty levels, casual, easy, normal, and hard, and at least to my knowledge, they don't affect anything in terms of actual stage layout or the number of enemies, they're just passive effects. Normal is the standard difficulty, while in hard mode, which is how I gathered all of my footage this time, you take double damage and your shields break faster. On easier difficulties, you take less damage and your health regenerates over time. The options are nice, though in retrospect I think playing only on hard mode while gathering footage was a bit of a mistake, as I now have an hour and a half of footage of a single boss fight due to how difficult it was. If anything though, that should go to show you just how tough hard mode actually is. I think the biggest issue with hard mode is that it just doesn't feel properly scaled for anyone but Lilac. With Carol, she has the ability to get in close and deal damage, but doesn't have the invincibility frames or mobility that Lilac has, so it makes it much more difficult for her to deal damage to bosses without taking some herself, which is a major issue when damage is doubled and even more punishing. Meanwhile for Mila, her health bar is barely more than half the size of the other two, which made her playthrough especially difficult when she had to fight enemies without projectiles she could reflect. This leads to hard mode feeling unfairly difficult at times, as opposed to just challenging. Another thing this game borrows from Sonic is elemental shields, though they work very differently here. The effects for the shields are purely passive and don't change the character's abilities at all, but in exchange for that, there are now five of them in total. The water shield, as expected, prevents the user from drowning, the earth shield draws in nearby crystals, the fire shield deals damage on contact and protects the user from fire, the wood shield draws in nearby life petals which refill your health bar, and finally, the metal shield negates all damage from spikes and other metal hazards. Additionally, while these shields will break after a couple of hits, they make their user completely immune to attacks from enemies that use that element. So for example, any enemy that shoots fire won't be able to damage you at all if you have a fire shield equipped. 
I think the expansion of this mechanic is really well done, though it can sometimes be a bit difficult to tell what enemies deal what kind of damage, making it hard to gauge exactly what your shield is immune to. The last thing to talk about in regards to gameplay are the game's bosses, and they're no joke. They start off fairly easy, but some of the late game bosses are genuinely some of the toughest bosses I've ever had to fight in a 2D platformer. Though, again, that might just be because I was playing on hard mode. Overall, the bosses are extremely well designed, and are one of the highlights of the game. Their attacks are telegraphed well, and once you learn their patterns, it becomes fairly easy to dodge them. The difficulty mostly comes in knowing when to rush in an attack, since the vast majority of your attacks are close range. They're very risk-reward, but I personally found that extremely addictive. There's a good mixture of size in the bosses too, with some absolutely towering over your characters, and others just being the exact same size as you, making them a lot harder to hit. And of course, you can't have a great 90s style platformer without having a good soundtrack, and Freedom Planet blows it out of the park. From mysterious tunes like Aqua Tunnel 2 and Battle Glacier 2, to fast-paced action music like Sky Battalion and Relic Maze 1, the range of this game's soundtrack is immense, and I don't think there's a single theme in this game that misses. A lot of the major story bosses have their own unique themes as well, which makes their importance stand out even more. Though, instead of talking about it, I think it's better if you just listen to the music. So here's a brief sample of some of my favorite tracks in the game, though I highly recommend you go check out the full soundtrack yourself. And essentially, that's Freedom Planet. Even with its more mixed aspects, the gameplay and level designs are extremely well polished, making this a fantastic love letter to 16-bit platformers in the same way that Shovel Knight pays tribute to 8-bit ones. But with all the Sonic comparisons, you're probably wondering why I titled the video this way. Well, when this game first came out, it was only a couple of years after Sonic the Hedgehog 4 had crashed and burned with its shameless nostalgia cash grabbing. This was also a time before Sonic Mania had come out and basically perfected classic Sonic. So naturally, when this Sonic-like game comes out and blows Sonic 4 out of the water, a bunch of news outlets and YouTubers took the opportunity to call Freedom Planet the true Sonic 4. But I feel like this severely undersold the game, because it's not just a Sonic fan game turned indie darling. It does a lot of its own things too. Its world's completely unique identity, the addition of a combat system, and a bunch of other things set it completely apart. And according to the game's director, further defining Freedom Planet as a unique series was one of the core aspects of the sequel's development. Overall, I would highly recommend picking up Freedom Planet. There's a lot of fun to be had with it, and when it only costs 15 bucks, I'd say that's an absolute steal for something of this high quality. But now that I've established the context, I'll be making another video soon discussing Freedom Planet 2, and why I think it might just be my favorite game of 2022, and one of the best 2D platformers I've ever played. Thanks for sticking around, y'all. I hope you have a lovely day. Stay safe on the roads if they get icy where you live, and stay fresh, Cephalus Squad.